It is June, and that means graduations, and at graduation time, we often bring you stories of exceptional young people. But tonight, we have one young man who almost defies description. You may have heard the Kenyan proverb, it takes a village. Well, you'll understand it a lot better after you see this. Our new reporter, Bonnie Boswell, is here now with details. Bonnie, welcome. Thank you for very much for being here. I'm really delighted to be with both of you. Tracy, the young man in question, Bethwell Bugwa, truly knows the value of a good education. After all, he had to travel thousands of miles just to get to this day. <laughs> Meet Bethwell Bugwa. At first glance, he seems like any other teenager. When he is not studying, he likes to hang out with friends and he enjoys playing music. Dreadlocks curl in tribute to hero Bob Marley. Bethwell, Murad, Bethwell just graduated from high school, but he almost didn't make it. He was born in Kenya and was extremely bright, finishing sixth grade when he was just seven years old. But there was no school for gifted children in Kenya then, and administrators wanted him to stay behind with his own age group. Rather than do that, his father, a single parent, took Bethwell out of regular school. Bethwell instead went every day to the University of Nairobi Medical Library to study on his own. For six years, I never went to school, and in that period of time is, is the time that I spent going to libraries and also giving lectures. People called him names like Genius and Whiz Kid. By age 11, he was giving lectures on science. He became famous, but what he really wanted was to go to a school for gifted children. It was somewhat bothersome just because, I mean, people would call me all these names, but, you know, there was nothing being done to help me. One day, Bethwell met an American professor, Lenore Blum, from Berkeley, who agreed to sponsor him. He applied to schools all over the world. Finally, he heard from the founders of a Merman school in Los Angeles, Dr. and Mrs. Norman Merman. Dear Bethwell, Dr. Merman and I found your letter most interesting and would be pleased if we could make it possible for you to attend our school in the coming year. So, at 12 years old, Bethwell said goodbye to his father and left for America. The only thing that came to my mind was, you know, I was leaving Kenya. Now that he was here, Bethwell needed a place to stay. With the Merman's help, he found several families like the Wilsons and the Mitchells. He was a doll in his own little way, and right away we fell in love with Bethwell. Gloria, you took Bethwell into your family. You had children, and you welcomed in. What was that experience like for you? I remember one night we had turkey for dinner, and he wouldn't eat. He said, this was my pet in Kenya. I can't eat this. After Merman, Bethwell attended the prestigious Harvard Westlake School. There, he became the MVP of his junior varsity football team, and he discovered art, a bridge between his past and present. A Kenyan proverb says it takes a village to raise a child. Bethwell's village is made up of his father, who left Kenya for the first time to come for his son's graduation, and some special Angelinos who made a little boy's big dream come true. This fall, Bethwell is heading off to college to study genetics and play football. Oh, what a great Tracy. My name is uh, Bethwell Bugwa, and I'm 39 years old. Uh, I'm going to turn 40 next month, February. Uh, it's funny because I'm actually not sure how old I am, because my mother tells me one thing, while my father, when he was alive, used to tell me something else different. Well, my mother say I was born sometime in July of 1978, while my father uh, told me that I was born, or the way I grew up knowing is that I was born on February 12, 1979. Well, the reason why there's such a difference, why everything about me says 1979, is because when I was young, my parents separated uh, when I was two and a half years old. And this is uh, somewhere called uh, Inokalao, which is in Nyandarua County of Kenya. And uh, the reason why they separated, uh, the usual, you know, separation, merit of differences, and eventually I ended up uh, living with my father. And uh, that's how my life began, uh, especially when it came to school. I went to school when I was at that same age, around two and a half. And the way that I went to school is I followed uh, some kids. 
uh, who were my neighbor's kids going to a nursery school. And I just followed them there and my father spent quite some time you know, trying to find me, but eventually found me at the nursery school. And the teacher actually was able to convince uh, my father to let me uh, continue with the schooling. It was not long after that uh, that I, was, I found myself in Standard Day 1 and uh, within a very short period of time, let's say in less than a uh, couple of years, I was actually in Standard Day 2, well, Standard 3, and by the time I was 6 years old, I was actually in Standard Day 6. Uh, and that is when I actually dropped out of school because my father actually thought it was best if he could take over my, my education for there was nothing that he felt the school was able to do for me at that particular time at that age. And uh, at that time uh, I spent a little time at home learning about uh, everything from mathematics to science, biology, uh, and not too before I turned seven I actually found myself at the nearby hospital called Okalao, it used to be called Okalao uh, District Hospital uh, and I went there uh, doing rounds with the doctors but the reason why I went there is because I got a cut I got hit on my head and I was bleeding and I went to the, the hospital and as they were patching me up, you know, I became very curious into knowing, uh, you know, the different things that the nurses were doing. And uh, my father was able to talk to them and, uh, you know, convinced enough that, uh, you know, I could actually go there and, you know, be following, shadowing the doctors and the nurses and taking some notes. And within three months I spent there, uh, I took quite a lot of notes. And for me to actually demonstrate what I was learning and also what I was learning at home, uh, I was actually invited by uh, a friend of my father who was a teacher at Nyandarwa High School, which is close by, to give them a talk about what I've learned and it became such a, a, a crowd puller that, you know, the hall just became overwhelmed. And because I used to have a bandage from the cut, uh, the rumor started uh, flowing through the village that the reason why I had to go to the hospital is because they needed to suck out some of my brains because I was too smart. As much as that was not true, uh, in a way or another, um, I was able to start attending a local uh, secondary school. And when I was there, because of the what I had done in, uh, you know, the high school, you know, lecturing, standing on a table, because I was like, I don't know, four feet tall. I had to stand on a table on a portable blackboard so that everybody could see me. You know, uh, the same kind of interest uh, spawned from students when I was in Okala Secondary School. And yeah, there again, I found myself standing on a table and drawing the brain and take, you know, talking about the different parts of the brain and their functions and, you know, the heart. And so it was. It was quite a big deal, you know, for a child who is barely seven years old, you know, talking about the brain, the different parts of the brain, about the, you know, the, the functions of the heart, the different uh, diseases and uh, uh, normalities of the heart. And, and so it became a very awkward moment for actually a situation for the administration of the school because now even outside people would come to the secondary school uh, just to see who is this uh, this little boy attending a secondary school and giving talks about the brain and the heart. So eventually I had to drop out because it was you know, disrupting the, the, the school. Uh, not long after that, uh, in 1987, uh, is when I saw the president. And seeing him does not mean that we had a prearranged you know, argument of meeting, you know, state house. I basically, my father and I uh, figured out that from the psychiatrist and psychologist that we had seen, uh, they had mentioned uh, some things about uh, special schools for gifted children. Unfortunately, in Africa and also in Kenya, we don't have, we didn't have those. I'm sure now maybe they do, but then 
1987, there were no such schools. And the only way for me to get an education, as you know, my father's belief, was to be able to attend one of those schools, but it had to be out, you know, abroad, because that's where they were, they were found. So one way of seeking uh, channels of actually myself going there, because my father was a, was a cobbler, you know, a shoemaker, a shoe repairman actually, not a shoemaker, was to approach the president and ask him to you know, assist us in being able to find my way somewhere to a special school in the United States. So what I did is, uh, what my father and I did is we, we were kind of tuning in to the radio to see where the president would be, President Moy, uh, Daniel Ab Moy, 1987, to see where he's going to be holding functions. And when he came very close to where we were staying, woke up very early in the morning and I'd memorized, you know, what to say to him. And the idea was to just go straight, just to where he was sitting, you know. And it was in Kijabi, Kijabe, which is uh, not far from Nairobi. Uh, he was holding a fundraising there for the hospital, it's a mission hospital. And basically when he was done and he had sit, sat down and, you know, there's final speeches at the end, we were sitting in the front, uh, you know, standing in the front uh, and with a big crowd in the back in a semi-cycle kind of arrangement. And the podium was in the front. And my father just gave me a nudge and that was the sign. And there I was, straight to the president. And then as I was approaching the steps to the, where he was seated, uh, all I could see was uh, the Secret Service, you know, trying to run on both sides to get to me. Then, uh, back then, the vice president was the former president, who was um, President uh, Mwai Kibaki. He was the vice president then. And I recall him, him saying, as I was stepping on the stairs, uh, you know, Mwai Chilie loved an anata um, chango. You know, meaning, you know, just let him be, maybe he's bringing some contributions, some donations. And they backed off and I continued and I went straight to the president and there's a very famous picture uh, which is still even being used today because the other day when it was uh, uh, Moi Day, celebrating Moi Day uh, sometime in October, he actually appeared and that was last year. That was almost uh, 20 something years ago when this happened but it's still in use. So um, I went and the picture pretty much shows me, you know, leaning up, standing on my tiptoes and him bending over with his ear, you know, trying to listen to what I'm saying. And I remember I was shaking. I was actually very terrified at that moment. But I realized that's the only time and chance that I have to actually, you know, tell him exactly in a very short, precise, uh, prearranged speech, which I memorized of exactly what I needed to read, which was, I need his assistance to go to a uh, special school for gifted to children. And it's now here, it's in the US. Well, to cut the story short after that, well, you know, it became such a big thing that, uh, you know, some reporters actually came to where we were staying and, you know, the story of my upbringing, you know, going to school, you know, was now, it became like a very national kind of phenomenon. And for almost two years, there was, uh, you know, these writings and debates about uh, special children, special, you know, intelligent children and what to do with them. And and during that time, I continued, you know, doing my lecturing here and there. I wasn't attending school. I was, you know, basically touring around the country giving lectures. And that was almost uh, two to three years. And uh, one of those tours, you know, took us to uh, Tanzania where I give, uh, you know, one, one of my lectures about the brain, the heart, family planning, and so forth, uh, in Dar es Salaam uh, University, which is the main university in Tanzania. And I remember even there, the same kind of interest, public interest, you know, just became huge until the, the Kenyan officials, you know, from the Kenyan embassy there, uh, the consulate there, they actually had to come and find from us what were we doing in Kenya, uh, in Tanzania and why were we talking you know, negatively about the government because what we were saying is despite all the efforts that we have tried to even to approach the president himself nothing 
has ever been done to assist me. And one of the reasons why we actually went to Tanzania is because my father had been told that we can actually re seek refuge, ref you know, be refugees at the UNHCR, which is which they have one in uh, in Dar es Salaam, and that's where we went. And uh, being there, our our reasoning of seeking uh, for being you know for seeking refugee status. Uh, maybe to go abroad because most of the Kenyans were being sent to to uh, Norway and those Nordic countries specifically because of uh, the political uh, system that we used to have it was very well, am I allowed to say anything? Well, anyway so there was a lot of persecution uh, going on you know, because of the differences in political level uh, thought and so there were Quite a number of Kenyans who are actually at the uh, UNHCR seeking a uh, refugee asylum. But for us, it was not uh, as refugees uh, for political reasons, but as refugees for education. And that was our justification of you know, seeking uh, to be sent to wherever they were taking people so that we can, at least you know, for me to actually be able to attain the education which I, you know, which I needed. Well, that didn't work, and uh, the government officials, you know, gave us an ultimatum. Okay, you guys need to go back to the country because, for one, uh, we didn't have legitimate letters which allowed us to get the documents which we did. We had was only my father's ID, uh, and you needed uh, immigration papers to cross, which you didn't have. It's nothing to the time the Tanzania. They even gave us fear to come back. We had to take the bus back from Dar es Salaam. Took us two days to get back here. And uh, in 1991, I still was not going to school. And by that time, I was uh, I was 12 years old. And uh, I was actually staying at Kenyatta uh, University uh, main campus. And I was staying with a friend of my father. Uh, attending some, um, you know, being attached somehow to the math department, uh, not necessarily officially attached, but, you know, just tagging along with my father's friend and learning you know, some of those uh, things that they were doing there, like Lotus 1, 2, 3, using the keyboard, and this, how to use these floppies, which were, I think, the five-inch floppies, a big hole in the middle, uh, and Learning how to use a Macintosh SE, I yes, still remember those. You know, how to use the floppies and how to use the mouse. And, uh, and I was there for about uh, two months when uh, the head of the department announced that uh, the math department would be holding a math conference, an international math conference at the Kenyatta International Conference Center, the ICC in Nairobi. And since I was, you know, basically I was part of the team by that time, you know, I was asked to, you know, to attend also and, you know, give assistance. And it was there, I was the youngest person there, but there were some Olympiads, uh, math Olympiads from different countries, high school kids, basically. I mean, you know, as part of the program is uh, competition, math competition. Well, you know, the other part is, you know, the conference itself which was being attended uh, from by international delegates. And it was towards the end, I think the conference was about three days. And I believe it was, actually, it was the last day when, during the tea break, um, a lady came to me and she asked me, you're too young to be an Olympian, you know. Because I was basically, you know, I was a 12 years boy, 12 years old boy, and the other boys and girls, you know, from high school were much, you know, they're much taller, much older. So she was very curious to know, you know, what was I doing there? And uh, I basically told her everything and everything about uh, my life history after that point. And, uh, and she was very interested. I mean, she was very keen on finding out more. And she asked me to go and uh, get my father. My father, at that time, we were staying in Limuru, which is about 45 minutes from Nairobi. And the, best, the next day, I just went to Limuru and uh, 
gave my father a note that I was being given by a lady, her name is Lenore Blum. She was a math professor at UC Berkeley, which is in San Francisco, California. Um, and she, you know, she was genuinely very interested in actually trying to help me you know, attain that dream of attending school, a uh, school that could actually cater to, uh, to my needs, my education needs. So when I told my father, he was very hesitant actually to even consider it a serious offer. Just take you back a little while back. Uh, during the time when I was doing my tour and you know there was all these uh, newspaper circus about my story, uh, about this genius boy, you know, giving lectures to professors and universities and all that. There was a time that uh, another what they call him a whiz kid. He was actually uh, his name was KK Kalanja, and he was um, he had he was a master in chess. I think at the age of fourteen, at the time when he came to do his tours in Kenya, and because of all the media coverage that I was getting at that time, his father was able to to find a way of us meeting. Because his son was also, you know, also being covered in the media as this, you know, whiskey in chess. And here's a story about a local boy, genius boy, you know, in sciences and biology and whatnot. And I think there was quite a big interest in seeing us meet, and we actually did meet. And uh, during one of our meetings, uh, my parent, my father, and uh, uh, KK's father, uh, you know, discussed about the possibilities of having me uh, go with them to the U.S. Uh, to a school, one of the school, the school that his son was actually attending. But before he could actually offer me that assistance, he had to make sure that uh, what the media is saying is actually true. Am I a genius or am I not? And so he arranged uh, an IQ test with a doctor. His name is uh, Dr. Kabide. He's a famous psychologist. Uh, uh, from, you know, he used to work in Nairobi at that time. So an arrangement was made and I went and I you know, was given the, the IQ test, the written, the verbal, and everything. And you know, there was big suspense, especially in the newspapers, you know, people waiting to find out, is this boy a real genius? And what not, you know, uh, letters to the editor, discussions, and I think a week later, the doctor announced in one of his, he used to contribute to a magazine called, uh, I forgot the name, but it was a popular magazine which I think came once a month, and in the call, in one of his columns, you know, he was discussing my case and uh, he just said, uh, well, the boy is quite intelligent, but uh, he's above average. And I think after that, uh, that's when you know the whole interest, especially with uh, KK's father, kind of waned. And I uh, remember, you know, being as a child, you don't really know what happened to the background, so the discussions which were happening between the parents, I don't know, but eventually I know they had left. So my father reading this, now coming to the story of Lenore Blanc, so my father reading this note from this American lady, professor, uh, saying that she can be able to help, but she needs to meet my father. So you can understand even him, you know, being like, well, is this going to be another KK Karanja, you know, scenario? But uh, I was able to convince him, and uh, the next day we actually went and we met Lenore. It was, uh, we knew where she was staying. She was staying in New, New Stanley. We went and, uh, yeah, my father and her talked. And I believe my father, after the meeting, was quite convinced that, yeah, this is for real. And I remember at that time is when action was now being taken. Uh, because the, the guest of honor during the conference, the math conference, was Professor, the late uh, Professor George Saitoti. He was also the, he was the Minister of Finance. Uh, but, you know, because uh, Lenore had met uh, him, because they're both mat mathematicians, uh, he, she was able to, you know, contact him. And within a day, I had my passport. And with the passport, 
uh, my father was able to give consent to the North. Uh, we went to the, the former American Embassy, which was bomb, bombed in 98. It used to be in Nairobi here. Uh, we were able to go and uh, we were able to get a visa. Uh, the visa was a visitor's visa and the idea was I go to meet her in the US and, and uh, find a way within mm -hmm. six months yeah, so when I took the note from Lenore to my father, who you know yes, lives in the, the Muru, uh, he was very hesitant to actually believe in the fact that uh, this lady is ready to help. Uh, this is based on the experience that we had when with Kelly Karanja, who had the free, you know, initially offered to assist me, but only to disappoint, I guess, my father's uh, hopes. Uh, but I was able to convince him, and uh, the following day, uh, we went to Nairobi, where Lenore was staying at New Stanley. And uh, after the discussion, I think he was pretty convinced, because right after that, uh, Lenore, who had met Saitoti, who was a both mathemat mathematicians at the conference, you know, he was the guest of honor, the late uh, Professor Saitoti, uh, he was able to, you know, make some calls, and I was able to, you know, at that moment get the same day get my passport, and uh, within a couple of days I was able to to get uh, my visa because the Noah and myself and my father we went to the uh, the American embassy, the former American, I mean, yeah, the former American embassy which uh, was bombed in 1998, and uh, within a, within a Spend of a week, I had my passport, I had my visa, which was a, a visitor's visa for six months, I think, either three or six months. But the idea was that I go in October, uh, yeah, it was actually three months because I was going to October, November, come back in December. But the idea was that by December, we we'll have found a school for me to attend uh, in the US. And uh, so Lenore left. And I was left with the documents. I was able to get a complimentary ticket from Kenya Airways after, you know, approaching them with the uh, with the backup from Professor Itoti, with a visa, with a letter from the NOR. So they gave me a complimentary ticket one way to London, and the NOR was able to get the the other half from London to San Francisco using her uh, mileage mileage miles. Um, so I was able to now complete a one-way ticket, which she would provide the other way, coming back once I, I was ready to come back. So that was in 1991. In October of that same year is when I left. Um, I was 12 years old, and I remember I left around midnight, uh, escorted by several of my relatives, including my father, and uh, well, my mother wasn't there, so as you can tell, during this whole span of my story, my mother has not been mentioned. That's because uh, the separation between my father and my mother was so that was so that there was also the same separation between my mother and myself. And I, I don't want to speak badly about my father, but as you grow older, especially now that I have a family. It's kind of hard now to think uh, the kind of things that were happening then, and it kind of sheds light into, what, you know, how a child can be caught up in between uh, two fighting parents, and and without a choice, you know, the child is you know pulled in one direction, and in a way that's what happened to me. Is my father kind of pulled pulled me toward him, and much of the freedom that a child should get to be able to uh, see both sides of the parents, I was denied in a way. So that's why, you know, my story only involves my father, but later on my mother actually it does come into the picture. So 91 October I left, went to the US, uh, but the greatest thing, and I think this is where, you know, that's where my faith in God actually, you know, gets strengthened is the fact, for the fact that uh, after the Noah left, my father and I went to back to the American Embassy and we got a list of all the schools that we could find. So they gave us a list. They even gave us a list of special schools 
uh, across America. So what we did is we wrote a simple letter saying this is who I am, this is why I don't go to school. Uh, we attached uh, paper clippings, you know, as many as we could. Um, you know, from the media coverage a few years back, and we sent them. So when no left, before I left also, I uh, received a letter, one letter from a school called uh, Marmon School, Marmon School for the Gifted Children, which is located in uh, California, Los Angeles, on Austin Holland Drive. And basically the letter says, you know, we have received your letter and we find your story very compelling, we would like to help, but would you be able to come with one of your parents to stay in the U.S. while you attend school. Now, the fact that Lano had already been here and she lives in California, 500 miles away from Los Angeles, which I don't know if it was a coincidence, but I don't believe it was a coincidence because the school is in the same state, only 500 kilometers apart. Uh, my father could not afford to go to America and stay to, in America, even work, even let alone come to Nairobi. So we contacted Lenoir and told her, hey, by the way, um, there's uh, this letter that came from Marmon School, which is in Los Angeles. Uh, is it possible that you can talk to them and see what kind of arrangements that can be made so that when I go there, uh, we'll just have to go to the school and see what they can actually do, given the fact that uh, you're here. You, I mean, you're in California also. What Lenoir did was contact at school. What the school did was actually contact the parents. By them contacting the parents, they were asking whether there would be a family willing to accommodate a boy from Kenya to come to the U.S. to attend Marmon School. Well, there was some overwhelming response because, I mean, this a first, I guess, in for that particular school. And so when I went in October, October 20th of 1991, uh, when I met Lenore, we actually did look for schools, you know, within a week, the first week I was there, I was, we, have, we were able to approach some of the schools there, uh, one of the public schools in uh, Berkeley, uh, and then another private school uh, uh, in a place called Mount Diablo, and I remember Diablo because even at 12, I didn't know Spanish, but the fact that she was able to explain to me what Diablo mean, you know, I still remember where the school was located, Man Diablo of, uh, Ber of uh, San Francisco. So anyways, a week later, I uh, went to meet the Marmons, who were the founders, and I, they were also the directors of the school at that time. And uh, we met them, uh, and then got right to, the bus right to business, so I was informed that a family had been located for me. It's an African American family. They were called the Wilsons. They had uh, two children, uh, a young girl, age six, and a boy who was actually uh, 13 at that time, and I was 12. He had actually gone to uh, Marmon School himself, and now was in high school. But the young girl was uh, also at Marmon School. So, I was to be with them um, for the school year, my first school year, which was in seventh grade. But the good thing about a moment school, and I'm sure for many uh, schools for gifted children, is it's, there's no grade per se. The, the way the curriculum is actually uh, structured is that they place you in different subjects and different, um, in different classes uh, depending on your strengths and weaknesses. So for me, I was good at one side, more or less sciences, but very weak in mathematics, in you know other subjects. And given the fact that uh, I had not taken any math classes since I was six years old, uh, my level at that time was as low as maybe uh, fourth grade math. I remember being given an assessment to see where to be placed in math class. I remember being asked, uh, "What is a quarter plus plus a third? Is it a quarter? Of, no, a half plus three quarters." And I still remember to this day that question because 
it gives me a perspective of how far I had to grow up to actually be able to catch up and you know be able to move on from the school for gifted children, go to high school, and proceed on uh, with my educational uh, path. Yeah, I remember my first year um, at Barman School. It was very difficult for me, and uh, for the most part, it's because of the culture difference. It's a culture shock. Uh, it helped a little bit that I was staying with an African American family because somehow I could relate. Uh, but the most part, which was spent in school, uh, as we all know, uh, they're bullies. Uh, people who make fun of you, people who try to take advantage of the fact that uh, you seem ignorant. And I remember there are several instances, you know, being made fun of. But I guess sometimes if you're ignorant about something, it's actually helpful. Because I remember being told certain things and, you know, being called a jungle bunny. You know, I didn't even know what that meant. Um, being asked by a big kid, you know, uh, to go to the bathroom. And uh, if I see somebody urinating, you know, in one, you know, urinating on one of the urinals, to ask them, you know, if I could uh, give them a blowjob. So you know, some things which you know I was very ignorant about, but you know, certain you know situations which would arise, which would actually make me, you know, uh, question whether I was in the right place or you know. Was I actually going to make it? And I remember after the first year, uh, you know, they were actually uh, thinking about sending me back to Kenya because the school was not uh, convinced that I could actually manage, uh, you know, the the subjects and the education that was being provided there. So I was given one more chance, and I remember the note telling me the same exact thing, you know. The moments, you know, uh, thinking about, uh, uh, you know, pulling you out of the school because, you know, you're not performing. But uh, one good thing is that, I guess, having a young mind, you know, you're able to adapt. And I believe my second year, I was, I was actually able to adapt very fast in the fact that, uh, you know, my, my grades went up. I was actually even put into now to the regular classes with other students, um, and at the same time, now this is my second year. Uh, I repeated, I believe, I repeated some classes again. I also took two English classes uh, to help me, you know, improve my English skills and writing and also speaking. Uh, I had a at the beginning, I had uh, my 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 PE coach was also my math teacher, and it helped at the beginning that I had other students coming from uh, other countries, you know, dignitary kids, you know, one of from Romania who could barely also speak English, so I could relate with him, and another one was a young Vietnamese girl, uh, you know, parents were stationed now in Los Angeles. And so it was three of us, so I didn't feel like I was a special case anymore. But eventually, at the end, we all dispersed because we caught up and we were going to have to be placed into the regular classes with the students. And uh, after that, uh, after my second year with Marmon School, uh, I left. Uh, actually, before I left, uh, my second year, I was actually staying with another family. Uh, because after the Wilsons, after the year ended, my first year in September of 92, uh, during the summer, Lano and I wrote some letters and posted them to, uh, uh, you know, parents of uh, students uh, also at Mormon School, and we got several responses, and one of them which uh, Lano felt would best fit was a, a Welsh family, um, a British family. Uh, who had one daughter going to Mormon school also, and uh, yeah, they they offered to provide me accommodation and you know they must be staying with them for the the full second year of my stay in America, also attending Mormon school. So when I graduated from well, when I left uh, Mormon school uh, during the summer of 
country, I believe. Uh, I was in Berkeley because I used to visit Lenoir. Every break I would get, I used to go to Lenoir. And I think that was important because, it would, you know, she would put things in perspective, for example. And I reach, you know, helped me grow up, you know, in these different settings, these different families, because I stayed with different families when I was in the U.S. going to school, is that uh, I always, she always made me remember, not made me, but she always reminded me where I have come from. Uh, you know, how far it has taken me to actually be where I am. That uh, because the kids uh, whom I was staying with, the parents were buying them this or that, that I should, you know, feel obligated to also receive the same kind of treatment. So I grew up with the mentality that, yes, you know, being very humble and be very thankful for the fact that I'm there. Beyond that, you know, it's a, I guess as a gift or blessing. So anyways, after staying with the Marmons, uh, I mean, uh, with the, they were called the Brisks, uh, that was the second family. Um, uh, we did the same thing with letters during the summer. Now I had, uh, was admitted to Harvard Westlake, which is a high school in, uh, also in Los Angeles. It's one of, the, one of the best high schools actually in the U.S., private schools. And I was given an academic, uh, uh, not a scholarship, financial aid. Uh, which covered uh, from 8th grade until I graduated in 1998, 12th grade. And uh, during my my 8th grade to 12th grade, I stayed with a family uh, called the Caribbeans. The good thing about the Caribbeans, they had, uh, they had four children. Uh, one of them was in college, UC Berkeley. The other one had already graduated. The eldest one was the son, had graduated. and. You know, doing his own thing. I think he was in Chicago at that time. The girl, her name is was uh, uh, Vanessa. She was at UC Berkeley. Uh, then there was Danny, who was my age, basically. So he was like, we grew up as brothers. It was from eighth grade to twelfth grade, I stayed with him. And growing up with uh, Danny, you know, like my brother, he was into music. So I also got into music. You know, he was into. Uh, doing tagging, I go into tagging, you know, these mischievous, you know, teenage boys things, playing basketball, you know, at their local park, and, you know, basically we became the regular teenage kids uh, growing up uh, in some Los Angeles neighborhood. And uh, so we used to go to school, the same school, he was a grade ahead of me, uh, but because we had two different campuses, there was the low campus, upper campus, uh, he would go to ninth grade, we no, 10th grade, which was 10th to 12th, he was in a different campus. And between 8th and 9th grade, I was in a different campus. So when he was graduating, is when I was entering 10th uh, uh, grade in the other campus. Um, so, 98th, I graduated, and I remember my father coming to visit, uh, to see my graduation. He was there for two weeks, and I remember him, you know, when I took him around, I took him to Magic Mountain, I took him to Monica Pier, I took him just as many places I could, you know, I could show him those things. Just I remember at one time, you know, he was very serious, you know, him saying, is there any way that I could stay here, you know, work here? And I'm, I'm sitting there trying to explain to him the kind of situation I was in. And as much as he was not happy with the response, you know, I mean, it, those were the facts and he had to accept it. So, but he came back after two weeks. And uh, in August, no, September, no, August of 1998, uh, I went to where I had been accepted uh, uh, with financial aid, which was McAllister College, which was in Minnesota, uh, which proved to be a very uh, mind-changing environment for me. Not because it's cold, but in terms of relationships, in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, you know, mental growth, and I had been admitted to several other schools. I had actually been, yeah. But when I had applied, when I was in high school, I applied to several other universities. I applied to Cornell, to Boston, East, um, Boston College. Uh, applied to McAllister. I applied to UC Berkeley, Stanford, even Harvard. I got accepted for a few of those. Well, not Harvard, but I got accepted to UC Berkeley. Uh, McAllister and some other liberal arts, uh, but because McAllister was the only one, you know, which gave me financial aid, 
and it was actually not a bad choice. I actually, you know, that's where I went to attend school in Minnesota, and I was there for four years uh, under financial aid. I played football. I was a very good uh, high school football player, um, one of the fastest kids in in the, in the squad. Uh, so one of the reasons I think they were willing to give me financial aid is because it was the coach also wanted to see whether I could be part of the team. And I only played for one year. And because I wasn't really into it anymore, you know, these guys were like this much bigger than me, these Midwestern boys from Nebraska and Ohio. And I'm like, I don't think so. And I had broken my knee in, in, in high school. I didn't want to go through the same experience. So, and the interest wasn't there anymore, you know. You know, sitting on the sideline in freezing colds of Minnesota during, you know, uh, those seasons when you play in the cold, I was, uh, I just gave it up. Um, but I finished, I graduated in 2002 with a Bachelor of Arts uh, in emphasis in biochemistry. Uh, my grades suffered quite greatly on my, my, my third year. Uh, as I was saying, you know, college is when you become independent. Uh, you start thinking for yourself, you start uh, learning about your own self. Yeah, and then, yeah, you fall in love, which I did, and got my heart broken. Same place. And yeah, so then you discover ways of dealing with that, which is very self destructive. And I remember uh, my, 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 my junior year. I barely attended my morning classes because I can I could barely wake up. And yeah, I actually got a zero in my calculus two class, which pretty much burned my grades pretty low. So, so if you ever see my grades, they're not exactly that low. It's just because of that one class. I got a zero for the semester. So anyway, so I graduated 2002, uh, BA biochemistry, and. Uh, I left, went back to Los Angeles. I got a job as a, okay, I held several jobs. And you remember that was right after uh, September 11th. And so, being a foreigner at that time was almost impossible to get a job. And I was actually just a fresh graduate from, from a college, from a university. And I'm not a Kenyan, I'm not an American, I'm a Kenyan. So the whole, negative view of foreigners, you know, was really affecting, you know, my chances of even acquiring a very simple job because, you know, this patriotism that was at that time was enormous. And so, but I was lucky enough to get a job as a barista, coffee bean, in LA, Los Angeles. And I worked there for several months and also worked uh, for, uh, an organization called Crystal Stairs, which uh, dealt with uh, low-income families, and basically they were providing services for uh, for these families in order to um, for them for the families to to have a place to take their children for daycare, so the the parents can have enough time to either work or look for a job. And so my job actually was more or less doing filing uh, and so I was there so my visa was expiring in 2003 so I only worked for one year between those two jobs for well, three months looking for a job after graduating uh, then the rest of the one year was divided between those two jobs until I left to come back incidentally also in October so I left Kenya when I was 12 October 20th, I came back, uh, I believe, on October 21st, coming back. How that worked, I have no idea. So, coming back, uh, I came back with $300 in my pocket after 12 years in the States. So, you can imagine once you land, uh, you know, those, this, you know, you get off the plane. First of all, I had like almost 18 hours to think. What am I going to do in Kenya? But I was so convinced that it was actually a very good thing for me to come back. For one, because all my entire family is here. I grew up without my close blood relatives. 
the people I used to call my my well my family, my brothers and my sisters, the people I grew up with, but not necessarily to people whom I was related to. So one of the the convincing factors for me to come back one was because I have a degree from the US. Uh, so it gives me better chances of getting a job when I'm, when I'm in Kenya. Two, well, my, all my family is here. And uh, yeah, I think those were, and three, I think I was just ready to change the environment. I think I really did miss home, genuinely missed home, and I wanted to come back to Kenya, you know, where I can actually feel like I belong. In the US, you know, growing up with these families and, and you know, just talking about your family at a distance, you know, my family in Kenya, it really did not make me feel at home. And so coming home actually made me feel like, yes, finally, now I can actually feel like I, I have somewhere I belong. It wasn't easy because right off the getting off the plane, well, the media was there waiting for me, hey, you know, what happened to the genius boy, you know, we used to cover in the papers back then. Uh, what happened to him? He came back with dreadlocks, you know, with an American accent after leaving you know, Kikuyu accent. Now I'm back with an American accent, dreads, you know, baggy, baggy clothes, and yeah. So I was ready. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't. I thought I was ready, but that's not the way, the way it worked because it took me three months to get a job in Kenya, you know, without American degree. And it was by some sheer luck I met somebody in Nairobi who actually recognized me, this young lady. And uh, she was like, but so we got into talking and because I think she had seen she had seen a newspaper article uh, when I came back and she recognized me. So we had a talk and she was like, Well, you know what you should do. I know this person who works for um works at Ahmed. Her name is Nikki. What you should do is, if you get time, I told I have all the time I need, I have, you know, I want. Just go to Amr, take this uh, Matatu number, uh, a light from here, and go here, find this person. Her name is Nikki. And see whether she can help you. Just go with your CV. So, actually, I didn't wait. That same afternoon, I just bought a Matatu, came to Amr, and, you know, went to the reception, asked for Nikki. After waiting for roughly five, ten minutes, Nikki comes by. So, Nikki, I'm thinking, you know, another, another Kenyan, you know, Kikuyu person, turns out to be a British lady, and then it's Nikki, and turned out to be my biggest supporter since then, that was in 2004. So I came back October 2003, by the time I met Nikki it was 2004, February. Yeah, so we met at the reception, I told her, hey, by the way, this is the deal. Uh, I'm having a very hard time getting a job. I uh, came from the U.S. a few months ago. Uh, here I am. Uh, the expectations of uh, my, and I'm going to be very honest, my father, were that uh, coming back I would be carrying sacks of money. But from the get-go, from the airport, when I landed, I had to make sure that he understands that I am no longer 12 years old. Uh, I'm an adult who can now actually make his own decisions without even having to involve him. And third of all, I went to the US to go to school, not to make money. And I think that part I've accomplished, which is going and coming back with a degree, which I did. As for money part, now that's something else that, can, that was to be discussed later. after. Um, so when I met Nikki, you know, I explained to her, you know, the expectations of my father were these, are these, you know, I am jobless, uh, I'm paying for his rent, you know, we're staying in the same room in Kiambu with, uh, with his current wife, with his two children and myself sharing two rooms. And I'm expected to be paid for food. Well, expectation was not said, but it was more or less assumed that was my role at that time. And I was, I didn't have a job. And as you can remember, when I was selling, when I was coming from the US, landing at uh, the national airport here in Nairobi, I had $300. 
And three hundred dollars, if you're gonna be taking care of uh, five people, uh, it's gonna last what, like a week or two. And I remember hustling, basically, you know, writing to my friends, frankly, you know, asking them, you know, to send me some money, whatever they can, because, you know, here my parents, my my father, his wife, are looking for, you know, some need. I don't know how to provide for them, you know, pay the rent, and they're very understanding. But you cannot do that for so long before, you know, you know, people start, you know, even your friends begin to, you know, question, you know, how come looking for handouts, why don't you get a job? And uh, it was a very fortunate event when I met Nikki because, uh, yeah, she told me, you know, just bring me a CV, the next day I brought a CV. Uh, she told me I can give you a job, but the job is not that glamorous. The job requires you to be in dust, basically. And that job turned out to be sorting uh, information, you know, records more or less files from uh, various departments which had been set aside when people were moving uh, from from uh, the old offices which were the headquarters into the new building which is uh, the opposite side of the old ones which now became the headquarters so a lot of files and files were left behind somebody had to go through them and she was dealing with the she had just began a department a unit called heritage so i came at the right time when the they were needing, you know, casual workers to actually do this manual work. But uh, fortunately, within three months, you know, seeing how I was progressing, uh, you know, I got into a regular contract, and I worked for Amref until 2005. Uh, toward the end of 2005 is when I got a scholarship uh, to get my master's in public health. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, from a university called uh, Brack, it's called Brack University. The actual school is called James P. Grant of School of uh, Public Health. Uh, I was the second batch, so I was very fortunate because they paid for my airfare. And when I was there, you know, they gave us accommodation and meals, and also the the, the tuition. So the only part you had to do is buy your own clothes. The only thing that they didn't have to do is, you know, basically wipe wipe your bottom, but everything else, you know, was provided for. Uh, this, the curriculum was pretty good for the fact that uh, most of the lectures came from from Harvard, from uh, uh, London, took school, um, uh, school of Tropical Medicine, in a very high profile university, so you got pretty good quality uh, education. And that was my second, that was the second batch. Now it's, I think, it's on towards the double digit uh, batch. Um, so I came back 2007, so I spent 2006 in Bangladesh, 2007 I came back, February I came back to Amref, back to Nikki, Nikki provided me something to do. Uh, at the same time I was able to use some of the uh, public health education I just acquired from Bangladesh in doing some research uh, for department. Uh, health policy and systems research, I believe. There used to be a department called that. And uh, from the work that we did, going to the field, conducting interviews, um, doing the data analysis and doing the report writing, eventually a, a booklet. Uh, I'll share that with you later, but it's a, it's a booklet which pretty much uh, documents the work that Amref had done in some areas of Kenya called Kajiado, Kitui, and Makweni, which are dry areas of Kenya, and the kind of work that Amref had done in terms of water and sanitation, in terms of uh, integrating water in, with health, you know, providing water and also integrating uh, health components into uh, the water aspect of the project. So uh, I didn't stay too long after that, 2000 I believe, 2012-2007, I got a call from India. They said, hey, by the way, I think you had applied for an internship with an organization before you left, before you graduated from your, from your master's course in Bangladesh. I said, yes. So they asked me whether I was interested in um, being part of that 
a research project in Addis Ababa in, um, um, in Ethiopia. And I said, yes, this is a chance in a lifetime. And I spent uh, five months in Ethiopia. Uh, we did a study there. I didn't complete it because when, when the head of the organization called INCLEM, International Clinical and Epidemiological Network, it's based in India, but they were doing the research uh, with, I believe, USAID in uh, Ethiopia. So when he came, so when he came, uh, he offered me an, an exceptional internship in India. In India, I was there for two years, 2009. Uh, towards of that, I came back, came back to Amref, and uh, since then I've been with Amref uh, uh, in various uh, uh, capacities as a project officer, uh, research officer, uh, digitalization officer, but uh, pretty much most of my work, even after graduating the master's, has always been uh, into information and records management, more or less knowledge management, because I'm very fascinated in terms of the kind of things you can actually put together, disseminate, and actually, you know, educate people. So my job right now is, um, is knowledge management, uh, including library services, and this uh, entails pretty much uh, records management, uh, archiving, uh, some heritage work for AMREF, and uh, now currently with the university, it's an extension of what I was doing for the organization. Uh, I got married, yes, and have two kids. One of them is Lenore. Uh, she's seven years old. She, you know, I think of her as a little version of myself. And I have a son because she's very smart. You know. She's always one, two, or three. You know. Yes, so we have to keep that up within the family. Uh, my son, the same. He's in lower classes, PP2. And yeah, then I have my wife. My name is Virginia, she's a Kamba, and I'm a Hui, so my children do not know any of their mother tongues, either side of the family, mothers, from the mother's side or from the first side, so they speak Swahili. Mm. And the Swahili they speak is pretty, you know, the, the Nairobi urban Swahili. Beto and Bukwa, yeah. thank you for sharing your story. Sure. And thanks for the invite. No problem. All right. You're welcome.